For this year's general election, registered voters need to watch for their ballots arriving by mail in mid-October. Following the instructions, seal your ballot in the envelope provided and be sure to sign the back. Envelopes without your signature will not be accepted. Look for your free elections guide in the newspaper or at these locations statewide. There are no polling places. So be sure to mail your ballot by October 27th. Hawaii, Hawaii votes by mail. mail. Well, hello, good morning. Hawaii does vote by mail. By now, many of you have your ballots and we're encouraging you to mail them in. Uh, good morning, of course. I'm Yenji Denise, joined by Ryan Kalei Suji, and this is Spotlight Hawaii. That's right. We want to thank all of you for tuning in. And of course, the Office of Elections for continuing to sponsor this conversation. Uh, we encourage all of you who are tuning in right now to uh, let us know where you're watching from, uh, share this video, and ask your questions for our special guests. Uh, which happens to be Kauai Mayor Derek Kawakami. He's joining us now live from the Garden Isle. Great to see you, Mayor. Thanks so much for taking time. We know you uh, are a very busy man ahead of this uh, reopening of Hawaii, and so to speak. And that's sort of where we want to start this conversation, if we can, this morning, talking a little bit about uh, Kauai's plans. We know that there has been some discussion between the governor and the mayors. Uh, can you give us an update at this point in time of uh, where Kauai is at in terms of this reopening plan that's happening on November 15th? Sure. Well, good morning, everybody. Um, thank you for joining us today. As far as uh, our status as we speak, we are still uh, awaiting some sort of signal from the governor's office on our uh, proposed rule 19, considering that proposed rule 18, which would have required the 72 hour quarantine and then a post arrival test uh, was denied. Um, what we're doing today is we're on a statewide a virtual teleconference. Uh, we will have a senior policy meeting to follow. And then our incident management team continues to uh, take a look at different scenarios and they formulate plans and contingency plans uh, based on those type of scenarios that may unfold come October 15th. Um, I have a question here, and I think that it relates to so, what, something that Andrew is asking us. This is something that was in the paper this morning. Why did the mayor, I think he means the governor, uh, deny a second test but approve the Big Island second test? Our understanding right now is that Hawaii Island will be able to get that second test for travelers that you had been advocating for but was denied. Uh, why, why one island get, getting it and the other island not? You know, I think... Um and there would be a lot of assumptions in my response, so please take it with a grain of salt. Uh, as of yet, we're not sure if uh, the Big Island got a verbal commitment or if that was signed, sealed, and delivered. I can speak to some of the issues that the governor had with our plan. Um, one, uh, I think the state had made assurances to travelers that if they took a first test, uh, 72 hours uh, pre-departure, and tested negative that they would uh, not be put in quarantine. Um, and that's a commitment that the state has made, although it's never a commitment that we as a county has made based on our unique situation. They also uh, formulated, uh, I would say, uh, a few parameters for the counties to be able to participate in a second test plan. Um, one of them was that it would have to be all purchased by the counties, that we would not be able to pass that cost on to uh, arrivals, whether you're local or visitor. We do believe, uh, and our position is that these travelers should bear the cost of this second test. It should not be on the back or shoulders of our taxpayers. Um, three, it had to be administered by the county. We don't have a Department of Health. Um, that is not the way that we operate. We uh, work collaboratively. We have a police force. And so we dedicate our police departments to enforcing the governor's order just as much as we lean on the state's Department of Health to help us with this pandemic. So uh, one of the, one of the um, I guess, uh, requirements is the county now had to start administering these tests, pay for all of the tests, and have it done at a county facility. So it made it very hard as mayor for me to agree to the terms uh, that they set forth just because uh, one, 
it, it seems unlikely that I'd be able to do all of that. And two, that was never our intent with the second test. Our intent, as we have made clear from the beginning, was to create a pilot program to incubate an economy that's going to be uh, coming alive during travel. And I'll tell you why. Um, I'm pretty sure that some of the visitor industry workers are going to want to know whether these guests that are on property are negative or positive. And so there is uh, economic supply and demand that we believe is going to come to fruition. And so it was never our intent to grow government and start running this second test program. It was always intended to be an incubator, a pilot, and have the private sector take it over. In your proposal right now that's in front of the governor, we know that you sort of adopted a, a tier system. If you can sort of explain uh, this latest go around and, and what's currently before the governor in this latest recommendation of how you see the county of Kauai opening up. Sure, it's a tiered system that serves multiple purposes. One, it gives our public, our team, and the visitor industry and all of the economic sectors that make up Kauai a tangible look as to how some of the decisions that we make are being made. And so it gives hard targets that does have some degree of flexibility built in for us to be able to respond appropriately, but it gives the public and, uh, uh, and our audience at large the ability to see uh, what consequences come with certain actions or results of those actions. So right now, Kauai is in tier four, which is the least restrictive. Um, there are still restrictions, but under this pandemic, tier four is the least restrictive. If we see a weekly average go up to a certain number, we would scale to tier three, which really affects the gathering sizes. Now, if you get to tier two, this is where our proposal gets much more restrictive. That would, uh, in turn, uh, ask the governor to go back into a 14-day mandatory quarantine. By this point, if we hit Tier 2, we have a ver very severe concern that the number of cases could lead to community spread if it hasn't already and could potentially overrun our healthcare system on Kauai. And of course, we don't want to scale back to any of the tiers, but tier one would look very much like our original stay home order, which would be um, the most restrictive. And I have to say that is the last thing that any of us want to ever do. Um, there's a question today about inner island travel, especially for Hawaii residents. You know, one of the things that they've been trying to do is stand up the Kama'aina economy. And I know there are a lot of people who would love to come to Kauai. So Aaron wants to know, why can't inner island testing happen? Are people able to travel inner island without quarantine? Let's talk. I, I know it's hard once people get here to sort of figure out, you know, once Thursday happens to figure out who's a resident and who is, uh, who, who's not, who's, who's one of these trans-Pacific travelers. But do you anticipate residents being able to bypass the 14-day quarantine as you have it outlined right now? Well, you know, our Rule 18 addressed uh, inter-island travel. Of course, um, from an equity standpoint, we said that it makes the most sense because we're treating all arrivals the same, right? This virus doesn't discriminate. Um, this original first phase of reopening the visitor industry addresses the continental travelers coming from the other states, but it still does not address our own local people that are traveling from island to island to visit family or for recreation. And so we said, you know, it's best to keep things simple and treat everybody the same. So everybody that lands on Kauai will quarantine for 72 hours and receive a test. And based on those results, would be able to get them out of quarantine sooner rather than later. I'm assuming that the reason why inter-island testing has not yet become available for Hawaii residents under the Lieutenant Governor's Travel Plan and the state's travel plan is because they've always talked about limited capacity of inventory for these tests. So right now, the state of Hawaii is trying to make sure that there's an inventory of tests available 
if we start to see large outbreaks. So these tests are being saved for people that become sick uh, as a top priority. And because there's uh, no surplus that I know of, um, they are reserving those tests for that purpose. I do um, and have heard conversations that the state is trying to figure out inter-island travel as we speak. And there may be tests or different type of tests uh, that may become available, but we have not heard of uh, any plan as of this point in time. And, and so just to clarify again, uh, there is a conversation, and, and maybe for those that are just tuning in, uh, you folks will be again meeting uh, with the mayors and with the governors uh, later today to sort of discuss some of these things and to get clarity on this tiered system that you are now proposing, as well as to sort of discuss some of this. So there is likely to be some sort of decision made uh, before obviously November 15th, is that correct? Or October 15th? Hopefully October, before, October 15th. Hopefully a lot, <laughs> yeah, earlier than November 15th. No, I, right, I, 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 I totally understand. Oh, uh, you know, like anything else, um, there's so many different moving pieces that I think the state is dealing with that, um, you know, we can only control what we can control. So what we're focused on, on our end is making sure that uh, everything that's within our wheelhouse is AJ squared away and um, and uh, we will wait and see whether or not they'll have a program or a system and process ready for inter-island travel by the 15th um, is not uh, something uh, for me to be able to commit to or say, but I can assure you that Kauai is doing uh, whatever we can to make sure that people are safe. That is our top priority. Let's talk a little bit about the safety protocols that are in place for Kauai. I know that because you have such low viral levels, um, you know, unlike on Oahu, there's a lot, there's a lot more movement, and people are allowed to move more freely. A lot more businesses are open and and have more capacity than what we have right now. Um, but one survey that I saw recently, and forgive me because off the top of my head I can't remember the source, but it said that mask wearing on Kauai was lower than on the other islands because probably people don't feel as as threatened because your virus is so low. Are, are you concerned with that given that Trans-Pacific travel is going to open up? How do you increase mask wearing compliance and, and make that a priority? Is enforcement on the table? What, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I am very concerned. Um, and it's just because, uh, you know, I think um, at times we can let our guard down when we feel safe and that's natural. That's just how things are and that's the way it should be we all sort of relax when we feel safe. And so if the island feels safe, um, that's not necessarily a negative thing, but it is a double-edged sword when people let their guards down and they don't know how to instinctually uh, respond very quickly uh, to the changing landscape if uh, things should become uh, unsafe once again. So I would say that in a pandemic, and with our basic guidelines that we've set forth. The positive thing is people can be as safe as they choose to be, meaning that if they practice what we've been drilling from day one, which is everyone should wear a mask to keep the person next to them safe. Um, if they can do that, they should be relatively safe. If people by now have built into their muscle memory a good hand washing uh, system uh, and they're doing it regularly and not touching their face just out of habit by now, they can be relatively safe. And we always say to please avoid gathering. Like if, if you can avoid it, it is safer to not gather. And the most important thing that we're seeing is for some strange reason, when we are with close friends and family, and this is the way it is as well, we feel safe around them. The last thing that we would assume is that our own loved ones would do us any harm. And so we're seeing a lot of people dropping their guard uh, around friends and family that do not live under the same household. I wanna remind everybody that we are all potential carriers of this virus. It is not obvious uh, as far as the symptoms that show themselves. So we have to even be more careful around friends and family knowing 
that there is a level of security that we do feel that can come back and hurt us potentially. So those are all the things that we're sort of drilling over and over as we move forward. You know, Danny has a question uh, that I know many parents are wondering and not only confined to the island of Kauai, but what would your recommendation be for your residents about Halloween that's coming up in a few weeks? Uh, what are you telling residents uh, on, a, on a date where many will usually go out and gather in family gatherings and go to other homes? Uh, what are you telling residents of Kauai about what their plan should be for Halloween? To exercise good judgment and use some common sense. Um, because by now, uh, I think we've drilled enough into the general public, the risk that poses itself whenever you're interacting um, with people uh, in general. So although Halloween is going and set to happen, there are alternatives that families can participate in. Um, you know, I think the CDC and the Department of Health has the best guidelines that they should uh, look into. But for many of us, uh, you know, we're going to watch like a bunch of horror movies and eat dinner at home and dress up. I know that when we were younger on the Big Island, some neighborhoods would actually have uh, like a parade where you know families can stay in one unit and kind of uh walk around the neighborhood just sort of like a, a a parade around the neighborhood um so there's many ways to enjoy i would like to remind people that are driving to please drive with aloha and i know a lot of people can be distracted in these trying times but there's a large number of children if you're going to be wearing a costume make sure you can see out of your mask and make sure you're wearing a face covering and make sure that you're visible. So all of these different things uh, can be utilized to make sure that we can celebrate Halloween in a safe way. But having the old Halloween that we're used to is not something that we should do, not in this place and time. You know, we've seen very low virus on Kauai, and that's wonderful. What? Are, how is Kauai doing e economically? Obviously, the restrictions uh, there when it comes to travel have had a huge impact on the tourism economy. Um, financially, how are your residents doing, and what are your concerns right now? All businesses are hurting. I mean, you know, when we were in the grocery business, uh, the visitor industry is, was critical to our customer count, and we base our operations and budgets on those additional 30,000 people that are on Koi at any given point in time. And so when you see that disappear, it, it hurts. And there's many restaurants. Um, I know the gig workers, the wedding planners, the event organizers are all hurting. Uh, what we're doing on our end is we're working through our Office of Economic Development and trying to utilize as much CARES Act money to provide the, the help and support to get through this, this big challenge. Uh, we're starting to see uh, the construction industry as a sector that has picked up some of our visitor industry workers. Those are workers that are going to be getting uh, paid well. Uh, on our end, at the county level, I know our planning department has been uh, processing permits uh, at a higher rate than previously seen. A lot of them because the workers are teleworking and they're much more productive at home so we're seeing some positive results from this shift in our operation. But my general concern is being able to have an, a, a reopening and keep our economy open um, because the disruption of having to open and shut uh, could be uh, more disastrous um, if we don't proceed with caution. You know, another question, of course, comes to just uh, schooling and, and having the opportunity for children to be able to resume in-person learning. Uh, we know that, you know, the DOE has sort of laid out their plan and, and their model of this combination of both. But uh, where do you see Kauai following, falling in in allowing students to return to the cl uh, classroom? And, and how are you sort of incorporating that into the overall strategy of, of the reopening? So our complex area superintendent, Mr. Paul Zina, is... Um, a part of our incident management management team, as well as his predecessor, uh, Mr. Bill Arakaki. So they, um, you know, the DOE on Kauai has access to a, a team um, that's ready to support, provide guidance uh, as far as best practices. 
um, you know, the Department of Education is a huge uh, challenging department as far as um, the different uh, operations, just island wide, each school sort of operates uniquely. And from what I understand, um, the principals have been given uh, some latitude on what their reopening plans look like. So it'd be very hard for me to assess generally uh, how ready a school is um, to open because I just have not been able to see all of the plans. But I do know that they're adapting based on the ever evolving CDC guidelines. And uh, we do know that children need to get face to face uh, learning as well. Um, and we're just trying to ensure that it's done in the most safe and responsible fashion. Um, and until then, the county is willing to do what we can on our end to provide support to the State Department of Education. You know, I know we only have a few minutes left, but I want to go back to what we had talked about at the start of this, which of course is trans-Pacific travel. Uh, what's confusing just as somebody watching this all unfold is that different islands seem to be having different rules. That's how it feels like when you read that Hawaii Island may get the second test, Kauai maybe not, Maui maybe not. Um, what What is your thought on having kind of a uniform system? It, it feels strange to me that each mayor is sort of having to go go this alone. Well, that's just the way it's been. And I don't think um, I'm in a position to say whether it's right or wrong. I think it's just, you know, the situation that we're in. All the mayors have a different landscape uh, to, to work with, different dynamics. And so from the beginning, Kauai has just done what we felt was appropriate. Uh, there could be challenges with having a one size fits all um, across uh, four different unique counties. Uh, although there may be some benefits that come with it as far as travelers being able to anticipate, uh, I guess more better and easily uh, what their travel plans are going to look like. But you know, people are traveling, if it's for leisure travel, they're traveling during a pandemic. So like any disaster, there there has to be some flexibility on their part to understand that they're traveling during uh, a somewhat dangerous period of time. And so they should uh, assume that there could be some changes to their travel plan unexpectedly, um, like any other disaster. Uh, I think it would be a challenge to have a one size fits all right now um, based on resources. Uh, if we, remain relatively um, safe moving forward and say the other islands have a, a large outbreak. Um, I don't know how having a one size fits all would benefit Koi. And then of course, vice versa. I think it's just a, a monumental task to try to, um, to, try to just uh, have uh, one program. But like I said, um, that's something the state is trying to figure out. On Kauai, we're doing what we can uh, with what, what's with, within our realm and our powers as mayors. Uh, you know, our time is wrapping up here, but I do want to bring up a, a maybe more personal question because we're seeing a lot of the comments here, you know, during this time where pe the people have been very critical of our uh, public leaders and those in office, you have received a lot of praise uh, from those uh, on your island as well as throughout the state. There are getting calls for you to run for governor in two years, people asking if you're going to seek a higher office. Uh, at this point in time, I know it's two years away. What What are your thoughts on that? Is there I, any interest in that at all? I'm very humbled that people appreciate um, the, the work that I do. I, I came home to be with my family. I was in the legislature and, uh, you know, Kauai is my home. I would uh, want to be mayor again. There's so many things that I have yet to accomplish. Um, I'm a relatively young mayor. If I'm lucky enough to do another term, you know, I'll be 49 years old. My daughter might still be in college. And so I'm, you know, I might have to work and find something to do. But as we speak today, I made a commitment to the people of Kauai that I wanted to be their mayor. And that is my intent. That is what I'm going to do. And I'm very humbled that the other people on other islands appreciate me. Um, but right now, I'm just happy being a Koi boy. It's just hard to explain. This is home is where the heart is. Okay. Well, in, uh, we'd like to ask you. I know this is uh, your time's wrapping up. You're going to be meeting with the governor, as we mentioned. So, uh, what's your final message to the folks watching today? 
we're all in this together. You know, to some degree, um, some people are suffering more than others. But, you know, we're going to do whatever we can to put together um, the pieces that have fallen apart. And I want people to not give up hope, to be optimistic, to take time to build in your day self-care. Um, this month is Mental Health Awareness Month. I want people to schedule in things where they can just love themselves and take a deep breath and understand that this is not the worst, that you know we have a lot to be thankful for and to put their mind in a peaceful place because I think there is, uh, all of us are dealing with stress to some level and it requires uh, certain techniques to be able to get yourself into a good mental frame of mind. There's resources out there. I want you to take some time to take a look into those resources, but we're here for you folks. We care about you folks and we want everybody to be safe. All right, Koi Mayor Derek Kawakami, thank you so much for taking time thank and you. providing an update uh, about your island. Aloha. Aloha. Well, Ryan, great to hear from him today. And interesting that we're just a few days out from the reopening of Trans-Pacific travel. And it seems like there's still a lot of unanswered questions when it comes to neighbor island travel. Yeah, and hopefully those answers, uh, those questions will be answered through this conversation that the mayors and the governor will be having. Uh, again, him saying that he doesn't think that maybe a one size fits all program would be you know, appropriate because each county has so many different needs. And we're seeing that firsthand, of course, uh, you know, with the influx of cases that are happening on Hawaii Island compared to the low cases uh, that are happening on Maui and on Kauai. And so each are sort of adapting in their own ways. And so both uh, or all the mayors are sort of looking for ways to find what is best for them. Of course, we know that Kauai has this sort of new tiered system that they've sort of outlined and they have presented to the governor and waiting for him to sort of give his response. And so we'll see what happens after they have this opportunity to have this conversation today. I know a lot of people will be looking forward to hear what comes from that meeting. Yeah, and I expect that that decision will come pretty quickly because as we said, uh, we're looking down the barrel of October 15th, that is this week, and you know, people, hotels and, and travelers themselves and residents really need to prepare for what this influx of people is going to look like. Of course, we did talk to John DeFries, who's the head of HTA last week, and he said he expects about 5,000, when things sort of level off, 5,000 daily arrivals, which is just, you know, less than 20% of what we've seen in the past. But that still is a good number of people that we haven't had uh, in the islands. And so that'll be big changes for everyone on every island. And we know that it'll sort of be a trickle in of visitors. They, they're they not anticipating a, a lot of people coming in right on uh, the 15th, but eventually those numbers are expected to pick up. And so we'll see how the infrastructure continues to hold up. We know that there are still some things they're working on in receiving uh, those guests. Uh, they you know, the state held a press conference last week asking for patience. They recognized that there will be some challenges ahead in just processing all of this. And so uh, we'll continue to keep this posted. And they say it's a moving target. Things evolve, things, uh, you know, different protocols and systems will be put in place, including potentially uh, more tests that become available. And we're going to be talking to someone later this week that will be talking more about a potential uh, new way of testing people here in Hawaii. Yeah, that's right. On Friday, we have the CEO and president of Oceanet. That is, of course, a local company here in the islands that is working on a saliva test, rapid test. We're told that it is relatively inexpensive, around $20. It can give you a result uh, in just about 20 minutes. You just spit on a, you know, a test strip and, and you get the result. Uh, we're going to talk to him about you know, how, a fit, how uh, safe and effective that is and when we could see something like that come to market. What's interesting is that they're trying to get that manufactured here in Hawaii. So that could also be a huge sector of our economy if that does come through because something like that to be widely available could be a game changer. And then on Wednesday, Ryan, we're going to be talking to the head of an industry that has been gravely affected by the pandemic. That's right. Of course, the restaurant industry uh, continues to sort of struggle through this with the restrictions of uh, the orders that, of course, are placed on the island of Oahu with uh, only those of the same household being able to eat at a restaurant. How are these businesses able to survive? Uh, and so we're going to be talking more about the restaurant industry on Wednesday. And so looking forward to continuing on these conversations. Uh, a lot of comments here and again, a lot of praise for Mayor Derek Kawakami, a popular guest, not only on this show, but throughout the state. Uh, a lot of people happy with the work that he's doing. But as he said there, Yanji, he's uh, focused on Kauai and not really looking ahead to uh, any other office at this point in time.
Yeah, that was a great question, Ryan. And I think that, you know, you saw a lot of people saying we want him as our governor and a lot of other people on Kauai saying, no, we want to keep we'll him. Take him. <laughs> yeah, because they're very happy with, uh, you know, and it's hard to argue with the results there. Of course, the economy there is suffering uh, gravely. But when you look at their viral count, the fact that they are at tier four uh, compared to the other islands, of course, they do have a, a lot smaller population, but it has been uh, refreshing to see, you know, just how well that they have been doing. That's right. And so we look forward to keeping an update on him as well as, uh, again, uh, the conversation that's happening between the mayors and all the other governors. We encourage you to stay connected uh, to the platforms of the Honolulu Star Advertiser for updates uh, as we near this 15th and the reopening and the, uh, of course, announcement that will be coming about that. Again, we want to thank our sponsors, the Office of Elections, for allowing us to have this conversation. And again, you can get more uh, information on their website on ways uh, that you can vote if you haven't already received your ballot in the mail. There's still opportunities to vote in person. Uh, we'll have more information that in, in the coming weeks, but thank you to the Office of Election for allowing us to bring you this content. Uh, until Wednesday, we wish you all a safe week and we'll see you right back here at 1030 then. Aloha. Aloha. For this year's general election, registered voters need to watch for their ballots arriving by mail in mid-October. Following the instructions, seal your ballot in the envelope provided and be sure to sign the back. Envelopes without your signature will not be accepted. Look for your free elections guide in the newspaper or at these locations statewide. There are no polling places. So be sure to mail your ballot by October 27th. Hawaii votes by mail.